people missed that introduction. So here, I'm just gonna back it up for a second. And you wanna stop it if you're looking at this. This is my um, introduction here. So this is pre-Darwinian views versus post-Darwinian views. This would also be a really good essay question. Um, and then we're gonna watch a video. Okay. Well, it's good you showed up today. Oops, back it up. And get some volume here. Let's pause it. Oh, shoot. What's that? Why is it not there? Try get over. Okay. Ah. Oh. <laughs> That's too many things to do. Multitasking here. Okay. After 400 years of collecting animals in the Amazon jungle, Alfred Russell Wallace is finally heading back to England. Yeah. Oh, you didn't get one. I'm oh, sorry. Sailing with him. Nobody usually sits in the front row. Thousands of specimens he will sell to museums and collectors. Exhausted from his travels, Wallace is looking forward to the comforts of home. Every one of Wallace's specimens is destroyed. His hard-earned records of which animals live where in South America are also lost. These notes contain clues to the question that Wallace risked so much to answer. It was the greatest scientific mystery of his time. Where do species come from? But now Wallace's thoughts must turn to a more urgent concern. Survival. His hands are burned raw from sliding down a rope. His lifeboat is leaking badly. Castaways have little food or water and are 700 miles from the nearest shore. Wallace vows that if he survives, he will never sail again. This is the story of the search for the origin of species and of the epic adventures of the two explorers who found the answer. Someone else not been keeping a secret. Another British.
English naturalist, had already answered the question of the origin of species years earlier. But he had dared to share his ideas with only a few trusted friends. Charles Darwin set sail on his own voyage 20 years before Wallace's shipwreck. He was an unlikely revolutionary. He lived in a time when most scientists believed that each species was specially created by God in its present form and constant, and not somehow the product of natural laws and changing. At the age of 22, Darwin also believed in special creation. He was even planning to become a clergyman. But then he got a surprising offer. Darwin jumped at the chance to sail around the world on a British naval vessel, the Beagle. The offer was more about his pedigree than his resume. Darwin could be a cheerful, upper-class company for the captain. No small task, given that the Beagle's previous captain became despondent and shot himself. The lure for Darwin? He was a passionate amateur naturalist, and now he'd have the chance to see and collect animals, plants, and rocks around the globe. Early in the voyage, he examined plankton with his state-of-the-art microscope, an instrument that only the son of a wealthy family could have afforded. Darwin was perplexed. Why was there so much beauty in the middle of the ocean where no one was around to enjoy it? Why were these forms created for so little apparent purpose? But for every moment of joy or discovery, Darwin experienced a hundred of suffering. He was often seasick. Not merely queasy, but desperately, violently ill. His adventure came at a high price. Darwin's curiosity was not limited to science. On the coast of Argentina, he sampled a local delicacy. Roast armadillo. He thought it tasted like duck. Not far from this barbecue, Darwin found an interesting fossil. It was a small piece of an extinct creature called glyptodon. It was part of its protective covering. Darwin had seen a similar bony shell on the armadillo he had just eaten. But this fossil came from a giant. The animal he discovered would have been dinner for a thousand. Darwin found several more fossils nearby, including ground sloths like this one. They were all enormous compared to living species. Darwin would ponder the geological relationship between the extinct and the living. Darwin didn't yet understand why fossils of extinct animals turn up where similar animals live today. After nearly four years at sea, twice as long as Darwin had signed up for, the Beagle arrived in a remote Spanish colony, Galapagos. It would have been the dream of most any naturalist to explore these islands. But when Darwin arrived, he was more exhausted than excited. If hell had a garden, he thought, this is what it would look like.
black volcanic rocks felt as if they'd been baked in an oven. The plants stank. He didn't see a single beautiful flower. The daughter that arrived here was not the great theorist that we know today. He was a 26-year-old collector, collecting really almost at random any kind of plants, any kind of animals, any kind of rocks. He didn't even know the meaning of what he was collecting until much later. He thought the island's seagoing iguanas looked dim-witted and hideous. But he did like a different Galapagos reptile, the tortoises. He even took a ride on one. You made it as a beast. on nearby islands look so different from one another. The island's mockingbirds also caught Darwin's attention. He focused on their subtle differences. One kind of mockingbird had smudges on its breast. Another had a large dark patch under each eye. A third had a pure white breast. Darwin was astonished when he realized that, just like the tortoises, each kind of mockingbird lived on a different island. So even though he stayed here just five weeks out of a whole five-year voyage, is what he saw here in these five weeks that left the greatest impression on Darwin and will lead into his greatest ideas. After stops in Australia and Africa, and as the Beagle turned home to England, Darwin had the chance to reflect on what he'd been seeing. <coughs> in his cabin, Darwin puzzled over the Galapagos animals. It was remarkable that similar but distinct creatures lived on such nearby islands. What would explain this fact? According to special creation, God made a different species for each island. But another possibility occurred to Darwin. Perhaps one species might have come from the mainland and then changed in different ways on different islands. The Galapagos animals were raising a radical idea. Species might change. After Darwin returned to England, he starts thinking about everything he saw on this five-year voyage. And he's thinking back to the geology, the fossils, the animals that he'd seen. And he's in this process he calls mental writing, just letting every thought stream to him until finally he has his big idea. Rioting was the right word. His ideas were doing violence to the established order. The best explanation for what Darwin saw in the Galapagos was that species changed into new species. Over time, one kind of mockingbird somehow became three. Tortoises multiplied into different forms. And what did it mean that armadillos and sloths live today? where extinct giant versions once roamed. Maybe, Darwin thought, 
Today's species are descended from older, extinct types. If so, then all species are connected to one another in a family tree. It is a simple, crude sketch, but Darwin's drawing is a radical new picture of life. Any species can give rise to new and slightly different species. As generations pass, grand species arise, and then great grand species. Darwin's bold idea was that species come from other species just as naturally as children come from parents. There was a word for this kind of thinking. Heresy. So the origin of species was natural, not divine. It was a revolutionary idea that overthrew special creation. It ran against church teachings and what most Europeans believed, including most scientists. Still a young man, Darwin couldn't reveal his great idea. He would be attacked and ruined. Many years later, Darwin's popular account of his voyage is a big success. He's published six books and has become England's most prominent naturalist. But he is still keeping his biggest idea secret. Darwin is gathering yet more evidence for his theory when at a museum he encounters an earnest young man. Reggie you Wilk, Voice of the Beagle. It is excellent. It's inspiring. Thank you very much. Wallace had survived his ordeal at sea. After ten miserable days in a lifeboat, he had been rescued by a passing ship. Off to my notes before I leave. Ah. Wallace and Darwin are meeting for the first time. The two explorers share a great passion for nature, but they are in very different situations. I'm headed to the Malaya Archipelago to do some research. Oh, excellent. Um, Wallace is single. He has to collect for a living, and he has yet to make his mark. Yes, no, I've never been there. Are you, are you collecting? What? Yes. Darwin is married and has a family. He is financially well off and has a scientific reputation to protect. Wallace is as open as Darwin is secretive about his interest in the origin of species. Little does Darwin know that this young man will soon force his hand. I could send you back some specimens if you like. Oh, very much so, yes. Uh, thank you. But please, no barnacles. I've just finished a, a work on barnacles. That... And Wallace doesn't have a clue that Darwin has already studied it. Um, have you written anything yourself? Believing that the question of the origin of species is still wide open, and despite having nearly lost his life at sea, Wallace sets out on a new voyage. He travels to the region between the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the Malay Archipelago. For the next eight years, he will collect and study animals as he hops from island to island in a 14,000 mile journey. Wallace is captivated by butterflies. His favorite group is called bird wings after their shape and large size. They command a high price for their striking colors. He finds birdwing butterflies throughout the archipelago. He 
He identifies new species, some that are slightly different from those on nearby islands. The Malay butterflies suggest to Wallace what the Galapagos animals reveal to Darwin. Species change. But Wallace, too, seeks to understand the bigger picture. Having explored jungles on opposite sides of the globe, he can compare where different groups of animals live and ask why they are found where they are. Wallace the collector now becomes Wallace the theorist. Bird wings occur near other species of bird wings in the Malay archipelago. Across the globe, in the Amazon, live different families of butterflies. Bird families also cluster geographically. Cockatoos live only in the Malay archipelago and Australia, whereas the Americas are home to macaws and hummingbirds. Around the globe, the more similar two species are, the closer they tend to live. Why is this so? Wallace formulates a new law of nature. It's about where new species arise. They don't appear in random places. They arise near similar species. He realizes the profound implication that species are connected to one another, like the branches of a tree. On his own, Wallace arrives at Darwin's still secret tree of life. Wallace finds more evidence that all species are related by considering some intriguing creatures. Manatees are mammals that live entirely in the sea. But inside their flippers are finger bones. Similar, apparently useless bones are inside whale flippers too. If God had created these animals from scratch, wouldn't he have skipped the fingers? Imperfections such as these vestigial structures make it clear that every species is a modified form of an older species. Zigzagging across the Malay archipelago, Wallace gathers critical evidence for his law. On the island of Borneo, he sees monkeys and orangutans. But elsewhere in the archipelago, in New Guinea, the mammals are strikingly different. No monkeys here. Instead, up in the branches are tree kangaroos, marsupials whose young grow up in pouches. Island by island, Wallace notes which of the two groups of mammals lives there, those with pouches and those without. Animals on the eastern islands resemble those of Australia. Animals to the west, those of Asia. It's as if a line splits the archipelago. It will be dubbed the Wallace Line. Why would God draw a boundary through these islands and put monkeys in the trees on one side and put kangaroos in the trees on the other side. This made no sense. Special creation couldn't explain the line, but Wallace's earlier law could. This species come from pre-existing nearby species. The eastern islands of the Malay archipelago, Wallace surmised, were once connected by land to New Guinea and Australia. So animals like kangaroos could hop on over. The western islands were never connected to the eastern ones, but they were connected to Asia. So the west had different mammals, ones with placentas instead of pouches. It's the history of the planet, not special creation, that explains the distribution of species. In Wallace's time, geologists understood that natural processes, such as volcanism, 
and erosion could change the shape of islands and continents. But what about species? How do they change? That is Wallace's next question. As a collector, he has a great eye for detail as he chooses specimens to sell to his customers. He knows that among all living things, from butterflies to snails, individuals within a given species usually vary in small ways. But what does that variation have to do with how species change? The answer comes to Wallace during a high fever. He must have been thinking about the very real chance that he would die. He recalled the English economist Thomas Malthus, who noted that human populations are held in check by famine, disease, and death. Wallace realized that was even more the case in nature. Without death, any species would quickly overrun Earth. But animal populations tend to hold steady. That's because huge numbers of young die <coughs> every generation. Two facts now snap together. Massive death plus variation. Wallace now sees how species could change. Those individuals with variations that give them even a slight edge will survive, reproduce, and in time outnumber those without the advantage. His is a fundamentally new picture of nature, of intense, even violent competition. Wallace thinks he might have an important new idea, but he wants a second opinion before publishing. He knows just the right person to ask, thousands of miles away in England. Darwin is shocked. He couldn't have written a better summary of his own theory of how species change. He called it natural selection than what had just arrived from Wallace. How could this happen? Both men observed slightly different species on nearby islands and concluded that species could change over time. Both had collected huge numbers of specimens and realized that individuals vary within species. And both had witnessed nature up close and realized it was a battlefield with massive casualties. Same fact patterns, same explanation. Great minds think alike. Darwin now worries that he will lose all the credit for his original idea. Darwin turned Wallace's manuscript over to two close colleagues who had been privy to Darwin's ideas on natural selection. They decided that Wallace's manuscript and some excerpts from Darwin 
should be read aloud together on the same day in London. The idea was to share the credit, although everyone involved, including Wallace, agreed that Darwin got there first. Darwin published his own masterful full-length account in 1859. On the Origin of Species became one of the most influential books ever published. It was an instant sensation that signaled the birth of modern biology. Wallace eventually wrote a book on evolution. He gave it the title, Darwinism. Darwin and Wallace, who framed a new view of life driven by competition, did not compete themselves. Instead, they became lifelong friends, bound by their shared, hard-earned insight into how evolution shaped the living world. Okay, you turn the lights on. You can take a look at your handout. And didn't Darwin name Wallace and his, like, as a contributor of this? Yes, I believe he did. So they read it, they, when they read it to the society, that was the first time it had been kind of officially published. And he read the letter that Wallace uh, wrote to him. But we don't talk about Wallaceism, we talk about Darwinism. <laughs> okay, so um, Alfred Wallace, motivation to um, sail was, um, I would say, let's see, his other major motivation besides collecting specimens was to understand the origin of species. So I'd say number one is C. Is that what you guys got? Okay. How about number two, what'd you get? A. A. Yes. And number three, you have to select both pairs together so you can't mix and match. So which one do you think it is? E. B. E. Yes. And number four, D. D. That was because, remember, um, Gregor Mendel didn't do his work until the same time. It was actually 1850. On number five, you would say that the reason why they share the similarities is, is that they share a common ancestor. So that would be C. And then this is the famous I think sketch that appears in one of Darwin's notebooks. And then what do you, what would you say that that sketch means? Species give rise to new Right, species give rise to new species. And that maybe species change over time. Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's talk about some evidence and let me make sure that I'm recording. Okay, so one um, point of evidence was biogeography. So this is the distribution of animals or plants And so one of the things that he noted, specifically Darwin and actually Wallace noted, was is that this we had different, um, animals and plants on different islands. And so sometimes this is referred to as island biogeography. So the famous birds that Darwin actually studied were the finches, but in this um, video, they talked about what was the birds. Does anybody remember? Was it the finch? It was the mockingbird, right? So finches, mockingbirds and tortoises, for example. So the idea here is, is that they were different looking, appeared, they appeared different, they were different species um, on the different islands. And so the thought was, is that maybe they both, um, both species originated from animals on the mainland and then when they got to the island, they diverged in their structure, right? So species originated 
from mainland populations. and diverged when they became isolated on islands. So differences in appearances, <clears throat> depending upon where they were located in their environment. And so that whole idea is called biogeography. The other example was the differences between, say, for example, um, marsupials and horizontal <coughs> mammals. So marsupials are primarily from Australia. And so where they are distributed on the islands would have been where they were in contact with those islands over land bridges. Whereas most of the mammals that are on the planet are not marsupials, but rather placental mammals. So that would be the biodistribution of, um, or biogeography of marsupials would be another example of that. Okay. The second thing would be fossils. So fossils are mineralized remains of animals and they tend to appear in different strata, so different layers. And so if we look at the layers, we have, okay. this is generally where the newest um, fossils are. So the newest fossils are near the top, near the surface. And then as we go down, the older fossils tend to be underneath that, so this would be older. And if we look down through fossilized sedimentary rock, sometimes we see the origin of new groups of animals. So we can find, for example, the origin of dinosaurs. So if we look really deep in the layers of rocks, we'll find the dinosaurs. And then as we move up the strata, the dinosaurs disappear. Right? And so this is the idea, well, those went extinct, but now we think that birds, that kind of reclassified birds, they used to be in their own group, and now they think that birds are actually related to dinosaurs, and so they are actually considered to be dinosaurs, birds are, um, that have survived to modern day. So fossil evidence, um, the people who study fossils are called, what, does anybody know? You're gonna study fossils? Paleontology, paleontology, okay. So we see in the fossil history, see um, species appearing and changing. and I'll put in parentheses, disappearing in some instances over time. So the example that he used were with the, like the giant sloth, right? Those fossils of the giant sloth were found near where sloths live today. And then also the giant armadillo near, is where near modern day armadillos, so perhaps the older giant ones gave rise to the smaller ones that have survived to modern day. Oops, three. Oh. Okay. So three, one of the things that they mentioned in the, in the film were vestigial structures. And so these are structures that once had a purpose, but no longer seem to serve a purpose. So once may have had a purpose, but no longer do. Okay. 
So a good example of this is in the aquatic mammals, because we believe from the, um, from the fossil history, we believe that mammals first arose on land, and then they subsequently re went back to the water and recolonized colonized the water. So a good example of this is in marine mammals. Or in the case of, yeah, so even manatees tend to be marine. So um, this would be fingers or finger bones in the flippers, but also vestigial pelvic bones. So whales do not have hind limbs. They lost their hind limbs. They don't, they, maybe their ancestors did have, we think their ancestors did have hind limbs because they lived on land. And then when they subsequently went back to the water, then they lost their hind limbs, and but they still um, retained their pelvic bones that would have attached the limbs to their body. We also have, as evidence, embryonic development. So this is the idea that we have homologous structures. So homologous structures um, have the same embryonic origin. Oops, structures, I'm running out of room here, structures. So this is the same embryonic origin. Okay, so if we look at early embryonic development in almost all vertebrates, it looks very similar. And then we start to see the divergence. And so when we look at the limbs of a turtle, versus the limbs of uh, rats, for example, early on during embryonic development, they are the same. And then as they develop, they start to develop similar structures, right? And, or different structures, sorry. So this would be, an example of this would be the arm of a bird versus a bat. Now those are analogous structures. Are those, homolog those are homologous structures. Yes, arm of a bird versus an arm of a bat. Similar but different. Versus, we'll put versus, versus a human arm, there we go. Okay, so a human arm versus a bird arm versus a bat arm. All of those have the same embryonic origins, but they are, they are different. Analogous would be same origin, but not necessarily same function. So I'll put that up here. So analogous, same function, not necessarily same origin. So the bird and the bat, they're homologous and analogous because they use them for flight. But for example, a bird versus a butterfly wing. So a bird wing versus a butterfly wing, those would be analogous, but they're not homologous because butterflies have all of their, their legs, right? They have six pairs or three pairs of legs, so they have six legs total. So they do not modify one of their legs to become a wing. It actually comes out of their exoskeleton. It's actually just a growth of their exoskeleton that creates the wings on the back of their body. And so they would be analogous, um, but not homologous. Okay, so let's look at just some diagrams, some pictures, okay? So this would be fossil evidence. So this was the giant um, armadillo versus the modern day armadillo. They're believed to be 
um, evolutionarily related to one another. This is the um, sloth, the giant sloth. So we see in the fossil record um, species that were once present but are no longer around today. And then differences in the tortoise. This tortoise has a shell that prevents it from reaching up to branches. And if you look at the plants that live on that um, island, the plants grow very low near the ground. And so it doesn't have to reach up. This one has modified shell so that and a very long neck so that it can actually reach up and feed off of taller bushes. And so it's the, um, it's the vegetation that determines what type of tortoise is found on which island. These are the marsupials. So we have marsupials that um, are very similar to our flying squirrels that we have. Marsupials like the kangaroos that actually have a very similar um, ecological um, habitat as compared to our deer, right? And then the wombat, um, re resembles what we would call a woodchuck. I don't think we have woodchucks around here, but um, that's what they would resemble. Okay. One final example of evidence for evolution, so we'll put number five, and this is what is called artificial selection. That says artificial, that's a C-I-A-L. Spell it right. Artificial, artificial selection. So Darwin was really into breeding pigeons. And so he noticed that you could select for certain traits so in the parents, and then you could get the resulting um, differences in the offspring. And so one good example of this is in dog breeds. So all dogs are thought to have originated, um, all dog breeds are thought to have originated from um, the wolf ancestor. So they have a wolf ancestor. So we can see through our artificial selection and breeding for certain traits, we can see dramatically how um, the different breeds of dog, dogs can diverge, right? So we breed them, we bred them initially to do different things for us. And now sometimes we breed them just because we like um, the way that they look, right? It used to be that we would breed them to do different jobs, right? Some um, dogs were bred to herd sheep. Some dogs were bred to um, kill rats on ships, for example. So artificial selection is another good line of evidence that species change over time. Okay. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about are what adaptations are, because oftentimes we use um, the word adapt incorrectly. So adaptations are traits that increase the ability of an individual to survive and I'll put or here, reproduce. Now, they need to survive and reproduce, but sometimes reproduction, the traits that allow for reproduction actually decrease your ability to survive. So sometimes male birds will have huge tails to attract females, but those tails actually make it less likely that they're gonna survive predation. So that kind of makes them you know, more cumbersome, they're not able to fly very well, right? So the predators can get them, but it helps them to reproduce, okay? So um, that would be an adaptation. So when we talk about this, these arise through natural selection. Okay. And we're going to talk about natural selection next week. Okay. 
And I'll put that individuals don't adapt in the terms of biology, okay? So to say individuals adapt, like I'm going to adapt, what I s simply mean instead of adapt, I in biology, this would be acclimate, acclimate. So they acclimate. That's not the common use of it, though. You don't say, I acclimated my behavior, right? You say you adapted your behavior, okay? Changed, okay? So they acclimate. So populations adapt, right? Through natural selection. So some individuals survive and pass that trait on to the next generation, and that is what we mean by adapting. So I can't just change my genetic material to make me make myself sickle cell heterozygous, right? Just because I need to adapt to <coughs> malaria, right? But um, populations can adapt by some individuals surviving and then passing on that sickle cell allele to the next generation. So adaptations are interesting because they can be um, anatomical. So for example, in the fish, that would be like the lack of scales, those ice fish that you did your homework on, the lack of scales would be an anatomical adaptation, right? They can be physiological. So that is more like how the body works, right? So that would be like the flow of blood, or that would be like the lack of hemoglobin would be a physiological adaptation, right? The presence of lactase in some individuals is a physiological adaptation. Okay. And then we can also have behavioral. So this is kind of a weird one because sometimes behaviors are hardwired, right, and can be innate. So when we say they're innate, that means that they're genetically determined, okay? Or they can be learned. And that is due to the environment. So like our ability to learn new things and language would be an example of an adaptation. The ability of a bird to sing its species-specific song that is genetically pre-programmed in it would also be an example of a behavioral adaptation. So I'm gonna show you one more little video to end the day, and it is on vampire bats. So vampire bats have a very unique um, adaptation which is called reciprocal altruism. So this is a behavioral adaptation that they have that allows them to survive and pass their genes on to the next generation. So reciprocal altruism in vampire bats. This is a short video. It's a good thing, short. Two minutes. Share your dinner with a friend who is hungry. Then you're more like a vampire bat than you might have thought. Vampire bats practice hematophagy, which means they feed exclusively on blood. But unlike their mythical counterparts, vampire bats don't actually suck blood. Instead, they use their razor-sharp teeth to bite mammals, typically horses and cows, although sometimes humans, and then lap up the blood that escapes from the wound. Fortunately for their victims, vampire bats don't take enough blood to kill. But finding enough blood to eat isn't always easy. Vampire bats hunt on most nights, but if they're unsuccessful for more than two nights in a row, they will starve to death. Fortunately, vampire bats, just like people, are often willing to help their friends. 
In fact, to prevent a fellow bat from starving, female vampire bats will sometimes regurgitate a portion of their most recent blood meal into the mouths of nearby female vampire bats. But proximity alone doesn't guarantee this behavior. Vampire bats use a practice called reciprocal altruism. They learn to recognize bats who shared with them in the past, and they only share with them. This includes familial relatives and current or former roostmates. Basically, they're friends. So far in the wild, scientists haven't found any evidence that male vampire bats participate in this food sharing process. And while the reason for the divide between sexes isn't completely understood, what is clear is that female vampire bats, like humans, get by with a little help from their friends. <laughs> So the idea here is, is that <clears throat> if they did not share their food, if they did not regurgitate the blood, then they would starve and they would die and they would not pass their genes on to the next generation. So this is a kind of a complex behavior that we see where they can remember who shares with them and who doesn't, and then they will share, um, regurgitate the blood to keep each other alive. Okay? So that's an example of cooperation as an adaptation. Okay, so there you go, your Thanksgiving topic for Thanksgiving meal topic. I just gave it to you. <laughs> okay, have a good weekend and I'll see you on Monday. We're not gonna have our quiz until Wednesday, so we'll have our final quiz, our very last quiz on Wednesday. Six quizzes, and I'm going to give everybody a seventh quiz, and then we'll draw. Where, which you won't have to take. Um, no, you're going to say so I don't want to. Oh, bummer, because that's the last lap. Oh, that's the last lap. Yeah, that's our very last lap. So you need to make sure you bring me your notebook. Okay. Yeah, and do your extra credit. Okay, yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. You have your homework? Thank you. For the final, it's only going to be over. No, if you look on the review sheet, it tells you what percentage. So about 70% of the exam will be over from the last one. Oh. And then, um, no, 70% will be over what we didn't have on the midterm. So about 30% of it will be over what was before the midterm. Okay.